danger. Now, we often hear about a future where people can put their feet up and let vehicles drive themselves. Well, it seems that day might not be too far off as manufacturers are testing driverless transport of all shapes and sizes. A fleet of self-driving buses was on show today and they could arrive in Scotland as early as next year. Our transport correspondent David Henderson has the story. It looks just like a normal bus, but there's a big difference. The clue is the driver. His arms are folded, he's not driving. That's because a computer's in charge of the steering wheel, the accelerator and the brakes. It's been built for two Scottish firms, Stagecoach and Alexander Dennis, who are preparing to use it for real. We wouldn't enter into any project without knowing it was absolutely 100% safe. Uh, we still have a safety driver in the cab that's able to take control of the vehicle uh, when the vehicle decides that it, it can't navigate that, that particular area safely. Uh, so we'll have a good level, level of redundancy within the system. So why have a driver at all when the vehicle can drive itself? The cautions prompted by tragedy. Last year in America, a test vehicle used by the tech giant Uber struck and killed a woman as she was crossing the road. The onboard computer failing to see that she was a pedestrian. Until a few years ago, driverless vehicles were a thing of science fiction. Experts believed it was too difficult to train a computer to drive in a complicated environment like an open road. Now they've been proven wrong. And by the end of next year, they'll be used to carry thousands of passengers every day between Fife and Edinburgh across the Forth Road Bridge. And that's just the start. They'll have a big impact on how we design roads and communities in the future. Uh, they'll have an impact on our environment and how we can actually change the way in which companies and businesses are operating as well. So ministers want Scotland to be a world leader in the use of this technology, not just for passengers, but cargo too. But one expert told me it may take time for people to feel comfortable with it. Back in the days when the elevator first got invented and being pushed up, we had to have a person there pressing the buttons for a long time because people did not trust the elevator to bring them safely from the first floor up to the 10th floor. I'm hoping that this will obviously be a lot shorter with Connect Autonomous Vehicles. Much has been promised by the makers of driverless vehicles. Smoother journeys, cheaper deliveries. By next year, we'll see if it can live up to the hype. David Henderson, BBC News, Glasgow. Well, we're joined now by Paul Hutton, editor of Smart Highways magazine, who was at today's event. Paul, thanks very much for coming in. First of all, I mean, we can see the prototypes there. Now we can see the bus, which, to be fair, looks like every other bus. When are we actually going to see these kind of vehicles driving around in our streets? Well, in certain parts of the world, the smaller pods you saw will, are already driving around. So they're already being used in university campuses and theme parks, things like that. The bigger the vehicle or the more complex the road system, the longer it will take. But because the fourth road bridge is closed to normal traffic and is only for public transport, that's why that's the perfect place to try this technology. And if all goes to plan, it will be next year. So you get on at one side of the bridge and get off at the other side? Yes. Yeah, so it's, Not it's, on it's right. And then beyond that, the plan is for a whole 14-mile section of it. Right. But, uh, but in the beginning, it will be, you know, it's salami slicing. It's little steps yeah. to, to get the technology. I can almost hear the people sitting, shouting at their TV screens, you know, what is the point of these if you've got a driver sitting in the seat? Well, eventually you won't have. And so as you saw with the pod there, the pod doesn't have a driver in there. So uh, I was at uh, an intelligent transport systems conference in Singapore three weeks ago, walking through a, a park there, and a, a pod drove past that was just taking people from one part of the uh, area to another. No driver involved. You just got on, it drove and got off. So it's a bit like a monorail at an airport, but these can go go far more complex routes. So you can actually foresee a time where there will be buses in Scotland that will not have a driver on board? Yeah, there will probably be somebody on board, but they can be doing more sort of uh, customer service and taking tickets and dealing with people and not actually doing the driving and let the technology do the driving. But I think it will be a long time before you'll be on a bus going over the Kingston Bridge at rush hour without uh, a driver at the wheel. And people will ask, why did they see a driver in those clips there? 
you've got to have a safety driver at the moment. There's got to be somebody there who can put the brakes on or steer if something goes wrong. But as I say, that's because it's very early stages. We're a long way from, uh, from the no driver situation. Let me ask you about the advantages of this, because you're, you remind me of the argument we heard about supermarkets when they said, oh, well, you can do your, your own checkout. There'll be a, 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 you know, a, te a teller-free checkout. There'll still be somebody around to look after you. We all know that was now because they could lay off all the teller staff and save money, right? What, yeah. what's, what's the advantage of this, apart from sacking a driver? The, think of it from driving a car. If you look at the statistics, 80% of accidents have some sort of human uh, mistake involvement in it. So if you can remove the human from it and replace it with machines that are, in theory, safer, that means that you can far reduce the number of uh, traffic accidents. That's the, the but, idea behind it. But you're not it. removing the human from the street, are you? I mean, uh, you know, if we look at that accident involving Uber, for yep. example, you know, you know, how, who, to, who, who would be to blame, I suppose? You know, who, who takes the rap if there was an accident involving a driverless vehicle and it was because somebody had walked out? Well, funnily enough, that's possibly one of the things that's slowing down the, uh, uh, the introduction of these vehicles is all those questions. You, we had at the uh, CAV Scotland event that I'm running with, Transport Scotland, uh, just over the river, um, we had the Law Commission of Scotland and the UK Law Commission both speaking about exactly that issue. And they weren't necessarily giving the answer they were giving the questions for the next part of the consultation because that's the difficult bit. Who's, how do you insure a vehicle? That's another difficult question. And the other one is uh, what's the business plan? Because there is a fear that you could spend all this money on this technology. It's brilliant, but it turns out a bit like Concord, which is an engineering miracle, but an absolutely terrible business case. In 20 seconds, if you can, how long till we live in the Flash Gordon future where all these cars and vehicles are whizzing around on our roads with nobody at the wheel? With nobody at the wheel, I personally think that's a good 20, 30 years away and you'd have to right. phase everything else out. I, don't, I think lots of driverless vehicles for buses, pods, things like that, that can happen quite quickly. Not ever having to drive and being able to drink what you like and then get taken home, that's going to take a while. I think we all see, thank goodness for that. These yes. incremental steps are important, right? Absolutely. Paul, thank you very much thank indeed you. for being with us this evening. Now, you are watching the Wednesday night edition of The Nine. Now for a recap of tonight's top 